Bible's over here. <laughs> All right, very good. Let's take our Bibles and turn over to the book of Acts. We're in Acts chapter 23 tonight, and we are looking at verses 23 through 35. Acts chapter 23, verses 23 through 35. Bodyguard at government expense. Interesting to see how God almost has a sense of humor in these kinds of things. Uh, here we find the Romans spending money to protect the Apostle Paul, paying salaries to a bunch of men because they're a bunch of bad guys who are out there trying to kill him. And um, not a very a fun kind of a position to be in, but at the same time, he could relax. The Romans were bigger and better than the 40 assassins, or the more than 40 assassins that have been hired to kill him. We're at Acts chapter 23, verse 23 through 35. And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready 200 soldiers, and go to Caesarea, and horsemen, threescore and ten, that's seventy, and spearmen two hundred at the third hour of the night. Pretty good contingent because they understood that in the Middle East, suicide bombers have been around for a long time, though they didn't have bombs back in those days. And provide them beasts that they may set Paul on and bring him safe unto Felix the governor. And he wrote a, man, a letter after this manner. Claudius Lysias unto the most excellent governor Felix sendeth greeting. This man was taken of the Jews and should have been killed of them. Then came I with an army and rescued him having understood that he was a Roman. Bending the truth to your little bit right there, he didn't know that he was a Roman until after he was in the castle and they were going to beat him. But anyway, having understood that he was a Roman, and when I would have known the cause, wherefore they accused him, I brought him forth unto their council, whom I perceived to be accused of questions of their law, but to have nothing laid to his charge worthy of death or of bonds. And when it was told me how that the Jews laid wait for the man, I sent straightway to thee, and gave commandment to his accusers also to say before thee what they had against him. Farewell. In other words, I am passing the buck. Then the soldiers, as it was commanded them, took Paul, and brought him by night unto Antipatris. On the morrow they left the horsemen to go with him, and returned to the castle, who, when they came to Caesarea, and delivered the epistle to the governor, presented Paul also before him. And when the governor had read the letter, he asked of what province he was, and when he understood that he was of Cilicia, I will hear thee, said he, when thine accusers are also come. And he commanded him to be kept in Herod's judgment hall. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the privilege of studying your word tonight. We pray that you will guide and direct us as we look into what you have here given to us for our edification and learning, that we through comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And Father, we pray for your blessings on all that is transpiring, both in the church and around the world, because we are seeing many things that may parallel what's going to be happening in the future here in America, things that might actually be reflected somewhat in our text tonight. And so, Father, we pray for wisdom and for grace, for understanding, for application, that your name might be glorified, for we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen quick review. So we'll see where we're coming from and where we're going to. The foundation we laid last week, we saw the law of harvest at work in the text. What you sow is what you reap, even if you're forgiven for your past. That's been a big theme for the last four weeks as we have been going through this particular section of scripture. Paul is going to suffer things that he has inflicted. The chief captain has legal authority, is threatening him here, but now is protecting him. And we noted last week that just because something is legal doesn't mean that it's right, like abortion and sodomite so-called marriages. The lesson that we've learned thus far, that brought us to the 18 things that we do not need to be ashamed about, the things that transcend our life resume. We're not going to cover them again tonight. But there were 18 of them. I hope you wrote them down. You know, every now and then, teachers give pop quizzes. <clears throat> and you know, if you could actually remember all 18 of those things, there might be a very big reward. <laughs> Not like the little bitty rewards that I gave out this morning. <laughs> Does anybody remember what those 18 things are that we do not need to be ashamed of? Hmm. Well, anyway, there are many things about which we do not need to be ashamed that both inform, motivate, and empower the Christian life. The second thing, 
We study the things from our past for which we are ashamed. Now, those are way too numerous to list, but all the sinless in Scripture apply here. For example, um, the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, or what we find over in the book of Romans, where Paul is talking in Romans chapter 1 about the various sinful activities of the homosexuals. The sin lists in Scripture apply here. By the way, do you remember what those sin lists are? Do you know where they're found? I gave you two of them, but I'm not giving you any more. Who knows, there might be a quiz at some point. Third, we analyzed what made the difference, and we saw that Romans chapter 9 and Romans chapter 10 tell us that the difference between shame and unashamed is Christ and Christ alone. Fourth, we then saw that Paul was, and the authority of the local church leaders is, a divine grant, and he was not ashamed of it. Authority comes not as something earned, in the church that is, Authority comes not as something earned, but as something granted as a trust for which a man must give an account. In the worldly things, people entrust it to people who've worked for it. But God doesn't do that. God has a very unique and interesting way of making divine grants and then holding us accountable for the things that he has entrusted to us. There is no self-earned authority before God. So a pastor, an elder, a deacon does not need to be ashamed or timid about the divine authority granted in Scripture. We have to use that authority in precisely the manner that God ordains, not as a mean for personal gain. That brought us to the importance of leaders in every sphere, making sure that they set the proper example because younger believers are watching. In that case, last week, in particular, it was Paul's nephew. We're not told a lot about Paul's family, but there are a few hints in Scripture, and I'm going to take one of those and develop it tonight. We're going to probably not get as far as what we hope for our message tonight in that passage that I just read, but I think this is important because it gives us some insight into Paul's family. We don't know a lot about it, but you know there are some hints in Scripture, if you stop and think about it, that tell us something about Paul's family. First, we know for sure that he had at least one married sister who had at least one son because it tells us that in our text. That was the little boy who came in and brought the message to the chief captain about the Jews who were lying in wait to kill the Apostle Paul. Second, we can infer from this that he may have had more siblings since normal Jewish families at this time were normally large in comparison to modern American families. As you look at the Old Testament genealogies and as you discover the families where it tells you how many people were in each family, uh, there were some that had up to 30 or 40 kids in the family. That was probably polygamous families, but we're not sure. But the average seems to be between 6 and 10. If you just take all those numbers, add them together, and then divide by the number of those families, you come out somewhere between 6 and 10, depending on which families you're counting as monogamous versus polygamous. They're a lot bigger than most American families today, where the average is 1.8. And heard recently that it's going down to 1.6, which is not even replacement value for uh, the parents. But anyway, we can infer probably it came from a family that was larger than the normal American family. Number three, and this I think is very interesting, and this is the point that I want to spend a little bit of time on tonight. We know with relative certainty that Paul's father was a tent maker, because the father always taught his son the trade, even though the son might be academically smart and able to progress in rabbinic training, which the Apostle Paul clearly did. But we know that he was also a tent maker because that's what he says he wrought with Aquila and Priscilla, for they were by their trade tent makers. He was making tents. He had learned a trade as a young man. The Jews have historically scorned men who only focused on book learning without ever learning how to do something profitable and practical. You learn to work with your mind and with your hands in Jewish society. That's in total contrast to the Greek society. Uh, the Greeks uh, had the concept that mental activity is what's important, not doing work. And you know, you discover that in the writings of the Apostle Paul as you move through the New Testament because most of Paul's books were written to churches with Gentile backgrounds. The Greco-Roman world the Romans had physically conquered it, but it was the Greek language and culture that had taken it over. 
Paul had some sharp words to the Gentile churches where the Greek idea of mental activity, philosophy, and refusal to mix work with thought prevailed. That's what I want to develop a little bit since it's practical for the modern American church. Paul refers repeatedly to the link between work and payday. <laughs> a lot of people go down and get payday even though they haven't done any work. The physical realm, you see, is the visible portrayal of the spiritual realm. There is no such thing as spiritual welfare state from God. Paul uses the illustration of work many times to speak of our spiritual payday. For example, 1 Corinthians 3 verses 13 through 15. Every man's work shall be made manifest. In other words, there's going to be a work inspection. Now, you know, I've done a lot of different jobs in my life, even when I was pastoring churches, uh, because churches many times couldn't support me, and so I did a lot of outside work. And I did everything from cutting grass and raking leaves and mowing lawns to working in a, a factory where they made gigantic air conditioners, and I'd work an 11-hour shift every night, six nights a week, uh, lifting and cutting between four and eight tons of metal, these sheets that were quarter-inch thick metal, four foot wide, eight foot long, shoving into a machine called the shears, and another Mexican guy and I would lift and cut that stuff every night. And it had to be precisely cut, because then it would be sent over to the press break or the punch, and they would bend it, this big, huge 300 thousand ton monstrous thing that stood all the way to the ceiling would come cold and just go whoop and it would doom quarter inch steel bend up like that that was a lot younger days before <laughs> couldn't do that kind of stuff anymore uh, I mean I've done that kind of stuff I mean you name it it's the kind of work that I've done lots of heavy manual labor but there was inspections we had inspectors that came around and measured everything that we did for its precision, or go over to the punch where the, through through steel like that, big huge holes this big around these things would come down, and go go boom, and it would punch out the holes, and seven or eight of them all at once, you know, in different places where tubing would have to go through, and there were inspectors to make sure that everything was right. Did you know, that's how your work is going to appear before God. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed. Three different Greek words for testing and measuring and making sure everything is the way it's supposed to be. And then it's going to go through the fire too. It shall be revealed by fire. For the tri fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Did you use junky material? You know, we, we think that some of the, the tests that are done here of our work are pretty stringent. Like, you think about the tests that are run on all the parts that go into a space shuttle. Because people's lives are at stake, we're going to be riding in that shuttle. And because of one bad O ring, the space shuttle explored and killed seven people. Every man's work will be revealed by fire, it's going to be tested. You know, if you stop and think about that, Paul had learned to do work. He wasn't just a brain, although he clearly was. But he was not ashamed to work with his hands. In fact, he mentions it several other places in the New Testament. But let me go ahead and read. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward, payday someday. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. That's grace. You know, full-time Christian ministry is considered in the Bible to be work. We've seen in Acts already that it can be highly dangerous work too. So much as any dangerous secular human job. Think of the most dang dangerous secular human job that you can imagine. Like hand feeding tigers and lions at the zoo or something like that. You know, Christian work, full time Christian work can be just as dangerous as that. You think of all the pastors, all the missionaries, Oh man, I gotta tell you, there is a missionary video. I hope to show it to you all sometime. Probably for one of our fifth Sunday specials when I emphasize missions. On the life of David Livingston, I previewed it just a couple of days ago. It's not just a talking head video. There are four or five Livingston scholars who have written massive works on what he did. But it takes you to Africa and it takes you to all these places where he was and it tells you about his work. Now I gotta brag a little bit. 
Uh, Mr. McCoy can probably uh, join me in this brag because we're both Scots. David Livingston was a Scot, too. Okay. My history is Scott. And um, what he did, how he never gave up. I mean, you know, on one of his missionary trips, he was mauled by a lion. He had managed to shoot it just before it got to him, but the lion got to him and gnawed into his arm and broke his arm so that it was sticking out the bones in two places. And that was in the middle of the jungle where there was no medical help and he was the only doctor there. And he managed to bind himself up and it never did set properly. So he could never lift his arm after that. He could use his hands, but he couldn't lift his arm up. He got malaria. He went back time and time again. When he couldn't even walk, he would have his porters carry him on a stretcher and say, we're going forward, we are not going back. Sort of like Winston Churchill in World War II. Never give up. Never give up. Never give up. That was a commencement address, and then he sat down. Nobody remembers anybody else's commencement address, but they remember his. Dear people, that's the kind of man the Apostle Paul was. That's the man we see in our text tonight. That's the kind of man, and there have been women like that too, who just didn't give up. Full-time Christian ministry is considered work. As we've seen in Acts, it can be highly dangerous work, so much as any secular job. But Paul says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This full-time Christian ministry we're talking about here. In 1 Corinthians 16, he says, Now if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord, as I also do. Philippians 2, verse 30, Because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death. Have you ever pushed yourself so hard in serving Jesus that you nearly died as a result? Not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. That's a mild rebuke. In other words, if you Philippians have been doing the job you're supposed to do, he would not have had to have risked his life and nearly died to meet my needs. What pastors and evangelists do is considered by God to be valid work. 1 Thessalonians 5.13 To esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace with one another. Writing to Timothy, he says, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Ephesians 4.12 Here speaking of the gift of pastor-teacher, he says, For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, of the body of Christ. Something else that we need to understand, especially in light of the cooperative ventures in modern education, work is to be personal. You don't bum a ride on the work of others, you do your own work. You know, uh, one of the things that my wife looked at with some disgust as she was working on her third master's degree was, uh, it was an education specialist degree, is they would have you do collaborative projects where the class, maybe of 30 students, would be divided up into, you know, four or five groups with five or six kids in each group, or young adults in each group. And um, the group was given an assignment. They had to produce it, and they were supposed to collaborate. They were supposed to work together so that it would be a project that would be productive. What she very soon discovered was that only one or maybe two people in each group did all the work, but everybody got the A. Yeah, I see some teachers out there nodding their heads. <laughs> yeah. You know what? God doesn't work that way. It's not a collaborative project in the sense of your rewards. You are going to be given a reward based on your own 
personal work. We're supposed to work together. But you're not going to get credit for the work that I did, and I'm not going to get credit for the work that you did. Paul says, Galatians 6, 4, Let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Hebrews 6, 10, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed toward his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. Hebrews 13, 21, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. We'll talk about that in a second, but God is actually the one who empowers us to do the work that he wants us to do. And work that he doesn't want us to do, you know who empowers it? The flesh. Your flesh works aren't going to get you any rewards. That's why the Apostle Paul was so intent to make sure that he was always in the center of the will of God. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 Oh, here we find some interesting things about the lazy guys, the ones who refuse to work. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. We'll talk about that in a second. Or how about 2 Thessalonians 3.12? Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. We're not talking about spiritual work here. We're talking about people getting a job. The Apostle Paul couldn't say that if Paul hadn't done it himself. You know, it's very hard to preach against sins that you're involved in. It's very hard for a preacher who's committing adultery to preach against adultery. It's very hard for a preacher who is stealing from church funds to preach against theft. But the Apostle Paul had no problem against preaching against those people who were lazy bums in the church not working. 1 Thessalonians 4.11 That you study to be quiet and to do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Remember, Paul is writing to Gentiles who... In the Greek culture, in the Greek world, the top of the, the line was the people who didn't know how to do anything practical at all. But they sat around and talked philosophy all day long. But they couldn't do anything. You know, the Jews scorned that. We'll talk about why in just a second. Your work, your job or occupation was considered a gift both given and enabled by God. I think that idea is alluded to in the spiritual realm by Paul's statement in Colossians and Hebrews. <clears throat> Colossians 1.29, Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. It was a gift from God. It's enabled by God. 2 Corinthians 9.8, God is able to make all grace abound to you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. God's the one who provides to enable you to do the work that he's called you to do. Hebrews 13, 21, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. God gets the credit because he provided the ability, the skill, the resources, the time, the energy, the place in history, and he took you and put you into the situation so that you could accomplish his will. So you, he gets the glory, not you, even though you're doing work for the glory of Christ. The Jewish concept, you see, of work goes back to the creation mandate. The creation mandate. Orthodox Jews, even today, view work as one of the first two basic commandments of God. I bet you could guess. What do you think the first commandment was that God gave to man? There are two of them. And work is the second one. What was the first one? Be fruitful and multiply! And the Orthodox Jews try very faithfully to do that, too. Orthodox Jews use no forms of birth control at all. And they have absolutely no abortions. In fact, at the Soroka Hospital down in Beersheba, which has a very large Jewish population, and also Bedouin Arabs who do not believe in abortions, they do no abortions at all in that hospital. Big hospital. Therefore, welfare type of people are deeply despised by the Jews, the Orthodox Jews, as being in rebellion against the second and one of the two most basic commands of God. Why? Because it goes back to Genesis 1. 
So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, there's command number one, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. Subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. That's work. Chapter 2. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, where he put the man whom he had formed. And the Lord God took man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. That's work. Chapter 3. All three chapters. The first three chapters of Genesis. The creation narrative. Verse 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Work suddenly became a burden because of sin. Thorns and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread. That's work. Not intellectual exercises of dancing about on how many angels can be on the head of a pin. Till thou return to the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. As to the creation mandate, it's therefore shameful that modern American church today has literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions, who promote birth control and secular family planning. Remember the two first two creation mandates. The first one was that issue of be fruitful and multiply, but the American church today, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, promote birth control and secular family planning rather than walking by faith and trusting God to give them the precise children, not just the precise number. They're always thinking in terms of numbers. Children are not numbers. Did you know that? Did you know that children are, number, are not numbers? They're real people. Made in the image of God. When you think of family planning, you're not thinking of children. You're thinking of numbers. You suddenly have dehumanized the precious treasures that God has for those who will trust him. Family planning is not walking by faith and trusting God to give you the precise children of your choice, of his choice. When you use birth control, you're not merely postponing children. Listen carefully. You are directly eliminating specific children that otherwise would have been conceived and born. You see, only one egg and one sperm can form a specific individual child. And a woman produces specific eggs at specific times in her life, and a man produces specific sperm at specific times in his life. you're eliminating specific children that otherwise would have been conceived and born. You know why I can preach this? Because Judy and I never used any form of birth control. Every child was specifically planned by God in God's timing. You know something else? I would much rather have God's choice than what I think that I choose. Now, I know God is sovereign. He's able to overrule. But you can't blame God for your sins. In the same way, the modern American church puts up with lazy, non-working bums, second mandate, who should be thrown out of the church and publicly shamed so that they would get a job and not bring shame to the name of Christ. And you know something? That's not just unsaved people who are in the church. We're talking about people who are really saved, and the Apostle Paul says so over in Second Thessalonians. Chapter 3, beginning in verse 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Now remember, Paul, from the biblical perspective, the Jewish background, if you will, but it's the biblical perspective, this is how God looks at work. He suddenly confronted with the Greco-Roman world where that concept is totally foreign. 
Yeah, everybody has to have a slave of some sort to do the work around the house, but, but we don't want to do the work. We're going to sit around and think about Plato and Aristotle and all the philosophy. We're going to read the Greek, Greek mythology and have fun at the games, and we're going to do, you know. Hey, folks, that's not the biblical way. With our football games and basketball games and ice hockey and all the other stuff that goes on out there, the American church is being lulled back to the Roman arena, and they may find themselves in the center of it one of these days. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, that's the word for lazily, working not at all, but are busybodies. Stick their nose into everybody else's business. Got way too much time on their hands. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Quit being a bum who mooches off everybody else. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Some of them were getting really tired of the fact that they were supporting all these bums in the church. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. The church should put people like that to shame. But we don't do it because we're way too nice. Verse 15. Now here, we know we're talking about real believers. We're not talking about unsaved people who came into the church. We're talking about real believers, because listen to what Paul says. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. They're Christians who do this stuff. Jews considered the lazy man who mooched off of other people on the same level as a thief, and Paul alludes to that in Ephesians 4. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. The Old Testament merely said, Thou shalt not steal. Paul says, you know, uh, after listening to what the Lord Jesus Christ uh, uh, has revealed, he says, you know, it goes farther than that. It's not just keep your hands out of my pocket. It's your work. Not only to support yourself, goes back to the creation mandate. But, in addition to that, you work something that's good. In other words, you can't be a Christian belly dancer. You can't be a Christian pimp. You can't be a Christian charlatan and scam artist. You have to work the thing that is good, but not merely so you can line your own pockets so that you can give. God gave you the abilities. God gave you the energy. God gave you the time. God gave you this point in history. God gave you the job. You work so that you can give. So that he can give to him that needeth. There are genuine believers who have genuine needs. There always will be. Jesus said so. The poor you have with you always. Dear people, you see, God's standards are a lot higher and go a lot farther, especially in the New Testament, than the law ever did. Paul himself set the example, even though he was not required to do manual labor to support himself. But he set the own example. We know that from Acts, where he's working with Aquila and Priscilla. But listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians 4.12. And labor, he's speaking of himself, working with our own hands. Being reviled, we blessed, being persecuted, we suffer it. And I do this in spite of all the trouble that's going on. He says, I could have demanded a big salary from you guys to hire a bodyguard for me because I'm really tired of getting beat up. <laughs> but he didn't. He worked with his own hands. How about 1 Corinthians 9, verse 6? Paul here is talking about the rights of an apostle. He says, Or I only and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? Listen, he wasn't just a pastor. He wasn't just a teacher. He wasn't just an evangelist. He was an apostle and a prophet, and he had all of the sign gifts, like miracles. Now you think about the guys who claim to be miracle workers today, flying around in their multi-million dollar jets, flashing their gold and their diamonds on television and saying, you paid for this. The apostle had the genuine gifts. Did he use those gifts to make merchandise of the sheep? Not once. He worked with his hands. He made tents. You know, a pastor who's committed to ministry is willing to work with his hands. Did you know that? I don't boast about it. 
but you know I work here with my hands. I don't just sit in my study and say, you guys take care of it. Things that haven't been taken care of for, in some cases, more than 50 years. Quit meddling, go back to preaching. Men in full-time ministry are supposed to be supported by the church, even though they are willing to work at other jobs to support themselves. 1 Timothy 5.17, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. You know, that's double wages. Especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. You know what the New Testament standard is? Now, folks, I'm not saying this because I want more money, because I don't need it. I really don't. The standard in the New Testament is figure somebody in a like capacity as a CEO of an organization of your size and of your wealth and then give them a double salary. That's what Paul just said here. Verse 18, For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. He's talking about preachers. All those who are not in full-time ministry who refuse to work were to be shunned by the church. We read it a moment ago, but I'll read it again. Second Thessalonians 3, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, lazily, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Those not in full-time ministry should be working and producing income. Did you know? that women have work to do too, but not outside the home. But if they're not doing the work that God assigned to them, they're in trouble. Listen to what Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5. Speaking about the widows, he says, well, let me read you the whole passage. Because their work is divinely ordained. But the verse, the key verse, is verse 13. With all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also in busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. Men can be busybodies, women can be busybodies. Paying attention to other people's business. Passing it on gossip over the phone. Hey, did you hear that such and such said such and such about so and so? And then that woman picks it up and says to somebody else, Hey, did you hear that such and such said such and such about so and so? And then it goes on and on and on. That's busybody, and God condemns it. 1 Timothy 5, verse 11. The younger widows refuse, for when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry, having damnation, because they have cast off their first faith. In other words, they were saying, I'm going to commit the rest of my life to serving Jesus and serving Jesus only. Paul says it's, it's not realistic for young widows to do that, because then they'll break their vow. And that's what immediately proceeds with all they learn to be idle. Wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also in busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. Verse 14, what's God's plan for the young widow? I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children. Oh, there we are, back to those creation mandates again. Very first creation mandate. Guide the house. Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Now, those of you who've raised kids know that it is work. I mean, if you're doing it right, it's work. It's hard work. And God entrusted children to families, not to the government. And you've heard me talk about that and rant about that before, about the mess of public schools. Bear children. Guide the house. Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Who is your adversary? Your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. And part of that is doing the jobs that God gave you to do. Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. List verse 16. We're not guessing on the adversary. For some are already turned aside after Satan. Did you know that when you're not doing the job that God gave you to do, the devil can lead you astray just like he did with Eve? That your tongue will become just like the tongue that God condemns over in the book of James? That you'll become that busybody gossip? Dear people, it goes on here in this church, and I know about it, and I've heard about it.
If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them. There's a responsibility for the children and grandchildren, and let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. The old women who are more than 60 years old, who have absolutely no means of support, no children, no grandchildren, you say, well, why didn't they bear children when they were younger? They did, but they were killed. Do you understand the history of the early church? Raising a godly child meant that that child would stand for Christ and would probably be arrested and executed. People, it may happen in our culture. You know, idle hands are the devil's workshop. 1 Peter 4.15 Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other men's matters. Are you a gossip? Are you a busybody? You know what you get classified with? Murderers, thieves, and evildoers. You can be as pious and hypocritical as you want about it, but you are in the same category as murderers, thieves, and evildoers if you're a busybody. Folks, that is serious business. That's how God looks at it. That's not what this preacher thinks. That's what God said through Peter. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 15. I'm not going to go into the next section. We've only got five minutes to go. <laughs> I think we'll close in prayer there. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that you will teach us to remember that you have given certain mandates at creation which still apply today that have never been revoked. We've bought into the world's way of thinking. Very sadly, the church has. And as a result, America is in the condition that it's in today because we have not been the salt and light that you called us to be. We brought shame and reproach to the name of Christ. And generations of Christian children have been murdered through birth control, all the abortifacient drugs and mechanisms. It's grievous to think. Not just children are being postponed, but specifically children, specific children are being denied life. How can the church speak with any moral authority against the murderous practices of abortion or sodomy? Things that are not productive of life. How can the church speak against the welfare state when the church doesn't do its job in terms of insisting that every member get a job and work and that the women work in their own homes. Father, we confess we have sinned. We pray that by your mercy and grace you will, as you have promised to do when we confess our sins, forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, again we thank you for your word and for its power. We pray that you'll help us to remember what you have said not what this preacher has said, but what you have said. We might believe it and obey it. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the hymn that I wanted to sing last is not in your green books, so you have to use your red books.